As for the approval of the Church, that is even an easier question to answer. This devotion has been approved by the bishops of Quito and the Church since 1634, for almost 400 years. In 1611, the Bishop of Quito, Salvador de Ribera, attested in official documents to the miraculous completion of the statue, and he presided over the anointing and consecration of the statue in the Conceptionist Church on February 2nd. The devotion and apparitions were also authorized and promoted by the Bishop of Quito, Pedro de Oviedo. He delivered the homily during Mother Mariana's funeral and praised her as the greatest work of God given to Quito and to the whole American continent. He attested to her heroic virtues and the charismatic gift of prophecy. Since then, the devotion has enjoyed the constant approval of the Church. In 1986, the Archbishop of Quito, Antonio J. Gonzalez, who, by the way, was not a conservative, but a progressivist. He was the one who initiated the cause of beatification in Mother Mariana de Jesus Torres. He named as postulator for her cause, Monsignor Luis Cadena y Almeida, and he established an ecclesiastical tribunal to begin the process. Now, this process was very serious. They took all the known works, examined them carefully, the books, written by Father Manuel Pereira, The Admirable Life of Mother Mariana de Jesus Torres, and they examined them carefully. At the end, the Episcopal Commission made a decree affirming that Mother Mariana had practiced all the virtues to a heroic degree, and they acknowledged her supernatural gifts and charismas. They also declared that all the facts were authentic, untampered with, and worthy of belief. Monsignor Cadena y Almeida wrote a number of books on the apparitions, the prophecies. One of those books, Mensaje Profetico, Prophetic Message, had the specific aim to show how all the prophecies up till these times have taken place perfectly, even to the last detail. This book has the imprimatur of the Archdiocese of Quito. There's another on the apparitions themselves, each of the apparitions, again with the imprimatur from the Archdiocese of Quito. Another to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the canonical papal crowning of the statue of Our Lady of Good Success, which took place in 1991. This indirectly confirms papal approval by giving the papal crown to the statue of Our Lady of Good Success, they are giving their approval to the apparition. That very same year, the convent was named an official Marian Sanctuary of the Church. This honor demands at least 100 years of continual devotion and approval of the Church. Therefore, it is clear this devotion has enjoyed the support and the approval of the Catholic Church since its very beginning. What is prophecy? Prophecy is God revealing one or more of his secret plans that will happen in the near or distant future. St. Peter tells us that if someone speaks a prophecy and it is fulfilled, God's voice has spoken. If the prophecy is not fulfilled, then only the voice of man was speaking. Now what we can clearly see is that the prophecies of Our Lady to Mother Mariana did come to pass, and that they have been fulfilled to the most minute detail. What were some of the many prophecies of Mother Mariana that were fulfilled? The postulator for the cause has written a whole book relating them, and at the end of that work, he reveals that there are more that speak of the 21st century. He was very taken by Mother Mariana de Jesus, and his work reflects all this. In one of his other books, he says, we will be seeing the fulfillment of the prophecies well into the 21st century, the middle of the 21st century. Perhaps maybe that'll be when she is canonized, I, I hope, okay? I hope we don't have to wait that long for the triumph of her Immaculate Heart because she basically says that she will 
tie up the devil and throw him into hell where he belongs. But first we're going to have to go through some things and there'll be a war and that many people, many good and bad people will be killed. And so that has not happened yet. That's to come. And we have to be prepared. We have to pray to Our Lady good success because she gives us a, a great hope that this will happen, that, that even though we have to go through these trials, that she will triumph. But we're going to come through this period and we're going to be paralyzed. She says when everything seems lost, when everything is paralyzed, that is the time of my triumph. So um, how paralyzed did we feel this year? <laughs> Some of us pretty paralyzed, right? Pretty, and, and if we don't have a faith, we're not going to do well in these times. We're going to despair. So she's there to give us hope. She's there to give us uh, encouragement and instruction. And we have to not, we can't forget her. We can't forget our mother. Because otherwise the devil is going to take advantage of us. So Our Lady says that those who conserve the faith will have to, under, in, in the virtues, will have to undergo a cruel and prolonged martyrdom. And I want you to think about what martyrdom actually means. Martyrdom means giving your life rather than deny Christ. It doesn't necessarily mean instant martyrdom, like having your head cut off or being shot. What we're undergoing is the prolonged martyrdom. This is already in place. They're trying to wipe us out with one thing after the other for holding on to the faith. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a winnowing fan. Who's going to be left after it? Um, it's going to take, it's going to take supernatural intervention on the level of our souls to give us that perseverance, not unlike final perseverance that we pray for on our deathbeds, but in, in a, it's slightly more pro protracted form. Um, but what we're undergoing is a martyrdom and prolonged. It's painful for them, and it is, it's prolonged because it, unfortunately, they won't be shooting us in the head. They won't say, deny Christ, and you say no, and then bang. I, th I think we'd all like that. <laughs> I mean, at least I would. <laughs> but no, it's going to be this. The devil is, is behind all this, and he knows every human weakness, and he knows that, that he's tried that before. When presented with a very obvious black and white, will you deny your faith, will you deny Christ, and then doing away with them, it doesn't get him as many souls as hacking away a little bit at a time and at their livelihoods, at their lives, at their families and everything. In the end, it gets him more. So that's why Our Lady said this is going to be prolonged martyrdom by demonic design. Lo que conozco es curioso. Eh, en esas épocas salíamos de la iglesia y nos para el, el señor sacristán y nos dice, de ustedes habla la Virgen. Estábamos unas 12 personas. Eso era nuevo para nosotros porque eh, recién eh, hacía poco tiempo que estábamos vinculándonos al tema de, de la iglesia, del catolicismo tradicional. ¿no? que éramos católicos practicantes comunes, como era cualquier persona en la década del 70. Entonces, eh, dice, de ustedes habla la Virgen. Uno de ustedes va a morir aquí, debajo de esta lámpara. Y en esa pared de ahí van a haber cinco disparos. Y esa imagen de ahí va a perder un dedo, porque va a haber una guerra aquí y un ataque a la, a la iglesia. Entonces, eh, a mí me impresionó mucho, a todos los que estábamos ahí nos impresionó mucho. A few of those prophecies, not a few, many of those prophecies concern the Conceptionist convent itself. I will just name a few of them. She predicted the day and year of the death of her aunt, Mother Maria de Jesus Tabuada, as well as her own death, as well as those of all the founding mothers. Another example, she noted that there would be a relaxation in the monastic discipline inside the convent after a century. This happened after 118 years. After the convent was established, there was that relaxation. 
This was one of the more important ones. She predicted that the Franciscans would be removed from the direction of the convent, and the convent would be placed under the diocese. This actually happened in her lifetime. As Our Lady told her it would, Our Lady also reassured her it would not happen under her reign as abbess, but under that of another sister, which in fact happened. This was a very sad thing for these sisters because they were part of the family of the Franciscans. St. Francis of Assisi was their spiritual father. And to be removed from the order's direction and placed under the archdiocese, or diocese at that time, was something very tragic and a great suffering for Mother Mariana. Mother Mariana was told that the community would suffer a long time from this loss of the Franciscans, but that finally a golden era would come when the Franciscans would return. This would happen at a time when our Lord would send a prelato to restore the church. Blessed and prized before God, this chosen son will ask the vicar on earth to restore the jurisdiction over the convent to the friars. Now this will happen, she said, only after a time, after a time, when the corruption of customs in the world will have seemed to reach its apogee. The convent today remains under the di diocese, the archdiocese today. And it's, we are surely in that time when the corruption of customs has reached its apex. Thus, we can expect that this golden era will occur sometime in the near future, after a chastisement, and as part of the complete restoration of the church and religious orders that Our Lady promised. In another apparition in 1610, she spoke more of this prelato, which, I think important to note, in those times was a word used to refer not just to prelates of the church, but to distinguish laymen as well. For example, on to identify the heart of Garcia Moreno, which had been hidden during the revolutions to keep the revolutionaries from destroying it. It said, the heart of prelado Gabriel Garcia Moreno. He was certainly not a prelate. He was a president of the country, a married man and a great hero. Um, there's a novena to Our Lady where they speak of Nuestra Señora Prelada. She was certainly not a prelate, but it was a sign of a distinguishing title given to important persons. In this apparition in 1610, she foretold, dire times will come when those who should justly defend the rights of the church will be blinded. They will join the enemies of the church to help them with their designs. Woe to the error of the wise. Woe to the one who governs the flock of my most holy son confided into his care but when they will appear triumphant, and when the authority will abuse their power, committing injustices and oppressing the weak, their downfall will be near. Paralyzed, they will fall to the ground. And happy and triumphant, like a tender child, the church will rise again and will rest placidly cradled in the capable and maternal heart of my beloved son of those times. Everything so far in that prophecy has come true. The ones who should be pastors of the flock, even the supreme pastor, are abusing their authority. But we have the promise of their downfall and the intervention of Our Lady. Paralyzed, they will fall to the ground. Now, let us go on to look at just a few of the prophecies she made that speak of Quito and its future events that were perfectly fulfilled. In 1599, Our Lady told Mother Mariana that after two centuries, under the influence of the Masons, Ecuador would cease to be a Spanish colony and become an independent republic after a long and bloody war. In fact, the republic was declared August 16, 1809, after a terrible massacre of the nobles and monarchists. 
Here is another prophecy she foretold, and it's a very important prophecy. She foretold that in the 19th century, a truly Catholic president would come to whom God would give the palm of martyrdom in the square adjoining the monastery. He would consecrate the country to the Sacred Heart, and this consecration would sustain the Catholic religion during the years to follow, ill-fated ones for the Church. And this was exactly what happened. The president was Gabriel Garcia Moreno, who installed a Catholic government overthrew the Masons, which is an incredible thing. His story is well worth reading. And he consecrated Ecuador to the Sacred Heart on March 25th, 1874, the Feast of the Annunciation. A little more than a year later, on August 6th, 1875, by an order of Bismarck from the Grand Lodge in Germany, he was massacred on the porch of the presidential palace on the town square, exactly as predicted. After his death, the Freemasons took control again, and these were indeed ill-fated years for the church. Mother Mariana predicted that the time would last from 30 to 35 years. In fact, it was exactly 30 years. The government lasted from 1895 to 1925. It is, today it's known as the rule of the liberals that time. And it was a virulently anti-clerical government that did all it could to destroy the church, secularize the state, and also to close the Conceptionist convent because they wanted to confiscate that property. But despite all their efforts and all their power, they were never able to do that, as Our Lady had told Mother Mariana, because this convent would last until the end of time. There are also many other prophecies that concern the whole world. Our Lady foretold that the proclamation of the dogma of her Immaculate Conception would be made in the mid-19th century at a time when the Church would be strongly attacked and the Pope would find himself a prisoner. On December 8, 1854, this was done by Pope Pius IX, truly a prisoner of the Vatican under Garibaldi, who had usurped the Papal States and the city of Rome. She foretold that the Assumption of Our Lady would be proclaimed a dogma of the Church in the 20th century. Pope Pius XII did this in 1950. One of the most significant of these prophecies we see unfolding before our eyes today our Lady revealed there would be an explosion of blasphemy, heresy, and immorality in the Church and society. Indeed, she pointed to exactly the time of Vatican Council II, which occurred from 1962 to 1965, and after it, progressivism installed itself officially into the Catholic Church. These changes led to the loss of faith she predicted to the decrease in vocations, she predicted, to the impurity in the world, in people, and in the clergy, even high prelates, and the complete breakdown of good customs. What were the prophecies that spoke specifically of the crisis in our times? One year before the statue was made, Our Lady stressed to Mother Mariana in fact, she was chastising her for not having made it sooner. It was January 21st, 1610. And she told her it was necessary for this statue to be made because it was necessary for a great crisis that would come in the future, shortly after the middle of the 20th century. For at that time, she told Mother Mariana, the passions will erupt and there will be a total corruption of customs for Satan will reign almost entirely by means of this Masonic sex. They will focus principally on the children in order to sustain the general corruption. Then she spoke of each of the sacraments, the abuses that would take place, how they would be changed or disregarded or given little importance. A lady of good success told Mother Mariana, well to the children, 
of these times, it will be difficult to receive the sacrament of baptism and also that of confirmation. Making use of persons in positions of authority, the devil will make a great effort to destroy the sacrament of confession. We can see that Our Lady was one as the devil. He's a fallen angel and he has infused knowledge. He has a greater intellect than any human being on earth. The only human that was smarter than him was Our Lady. And so he knows where to strike in the battle. And so the sacraments are the economy of salvation. The main way we save our soul is through the sacraments. And this is what he did. He attacked the sacraments. In the Second Vatican Council, not only did they create a new mass, they also, they changed all the sacraments, the formulas and so forth. And this is, we see this. And so baptism, we see so many people don't take it serious today. We see how many children are not baptized until our ages. We see so many people that have children out of wedlock and the ba children are not baptized. She's telling us that this is what we're going through. She said it will also with confirmation. And this is what happened after the Second Vatican Council, that the bishops, they used to confirm at the age of maybe 12, the latest. Now they started saying, no, we won't confirm children until they're 16 years old. Well, unfortunately, by the time they are 16 years old, most of them have lost their purity. And what happens in uh, confirmation, it's a uh, completion of your baptismal grace. And we receive an outpouring of fortitude. And these children need that fortitude to fight the peer pressure, to fight the evil that is around them. And so this has, once again, taken the weapons that God has given us away. And we see that our shepherds basically have abandoned their flock. Instead of protecting them from the wolves, they are handing them over to be devoured. I say, you know, we used to say they're, they're wolves in sheep clothing, but today they're not even in sheep's clothing. They're wolves. They have abandoned their people in this past year. What happened? Our bishops, they shut down the churches. People weren't getting baptized. People can't get anointed. To everything, no confirmations, no Eucharist. This is the, the only ones that can oppose this is the Catholic Church. And there are bishops, instead of feeding the flock, shepherding the flock, they are devouring the flock and leading. And they, our Lord said, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have eternal life. And what do they do? They deny us the Eucharist. They've, the people couldn't get anointed. They're going in the hospital, they're dying, they can't get anointed. They won't let priests like me into the hospital to anoint sick. And our lady talks about that. I'm going to read that in, in the prophecy. And so this is all through the infiltration of the Masons and the priesthood, and they have destroying souls. Souls are being led to hell because we need the sacraments. In the early church, Catholics would receive communion every day if possible because they know if they didn't, they wouldn't be able to endure the persecution. They wouldn't. And if they would be caught at mass, they would be put to death. They would be put to death. And they still went to, the, to receive the Eucharist. How many people are in hospitals that can't be anointed? And this was another crime since the council. They started implementing all these Crazy things, extraordinary Eucharistic ministers, having lay people usurping the rights of priests, going into the hospitals, giving hosts to people that are dying or very sick. Well, I was a chaplain in hospital for many years, and the average person I visited in the hospital was away from the church for 25 years, no confession. And so when these lay people go in, what do they do? They receive the Eucharist. They come in sacrilege. And this is, this is not saving people, it's leading people to hell. All these things have been happening for the last 60 years. So Our Lady warned us about this, and she was right. Unfortunately, she was right. Our Lady warned us too. She said there will be a great effort to destroy the sacrament of confession. I cannot tell you as a priest 
how true this is. I'm a missionary priest. I've been conducting missions for many, many years. I've been a priest 22 years. And I was going to missions, preaching all week. I was hearing confessions 12 to 16 hours a day. And the damage that is done since the council is devastating because they, the priests, even traditional priests, have not been trained properly in the confessional. The great moral doctor of the church is St. Alphonse Liguori, and nobody wants to follow him. St. John Vianney said he didn't become a good confessor till he read the works of St. Alphonse. And so today the priests, because they're not trained right, even when people go to the confession, they, the, the confession has become a revolving door. And in order to receive absolution, you have to have true sorrow for your sins. You have to confess them, species and number. But you also have to have a memory of life. And so many people are what we call recidivist sinners, that they keep committing the same mortal sin without ever amending their life. And those people, for the good of their soul, must be delayed. The absolution must be delayed must be delayed. And then remedies must be given to them to uproot the vice. They must remove the occasions of sin. And so because the priests haven't been trained right, even traditional priests, they go and absolve these people. And meanwhile, the absolutions after, so, after three times and not having an amendment in their life are not even valid. Many of these people are despairing. They're despairing because they say the sacraments don't work. I pray the rosary every day. I go to confession every week and I can't stop sinning. This is the crime. It's so sad to see these souls. I was blessed that I had a holy professor that taught us nothing but St. Alphonse Liguori. And so when you apply his teachings to these poor sinners, you set them free. I have people that have come to me that have been in bondage for 30, 40, even 50 years. And when you do what St. Alphonse says, you delay the absolution, you give them the remedies, you uproot the vice. They want to literally kiss your feet because they've been in bondage for so many years. And today, with all this, what they've done, not only in the United States, throughout the whole world, people are despairing because they're not, they don't have access to the sacraments. I just read today that in Ireland, they just passed a law that if you were caught at the holy sacrifice of the mass, you receive five years imprisonment. Five years. And this is, and it's, and it's, people think this is going away. It's not going away because we're in a severe crisis and God is pouring out these chastisements on us so that we will repent. When we stop sinning, God will answer our prayers. I want to quote another prophecy that Our Lady of Good Success told Mother Mariana. I quote, the same will happen with Holy Communion. How deeply I grieve to manifest to you the many enormous sacrileges, both public and secret, that will occur from the profanations of the Holy Eucharist. This is so true, my friends. It never ceases to amaze me when I do a mission and I preach about people that commit sacrilege where they know that they're in mortal sin and they still receive Jesus in the Eucharist. And when you do that, you bring condemnation upon yourself and you desecrate our Lord in the Eucharist. So many people, and sometimes I'm still shocked to this day. I said, are you sure you knew you committed a mortal sin? Yes, Father. Are you, and you knew you shouldn't go to communion? Yes, Father. How many years have you been doing this? Some people, 40 years. 40 years. Sacrilege communion is rampant. In the Novus Ordo Church, I don't know how these priests give communion to these people, these women that come up half nude. In modestly dressed, they're committing sacrilege when they see our Lord dressed in modesty, in modest like that. The priest is committing sacrilege when he gives a woman communion when she's immodest. These priests let these women get married. They come down the aisle on their, their wedding day. They're going to confect the, the sacrament with their spouse. 
and everything is hanging out, showing, in modest. I would never marry anyone, and no woman dressed like that, and no priest. He commits sacrilege. This sacrilege is on su such a wide, wide span. It's unbelievable. And that's one of the worst sins you could commit. It's against the first commandment. The commandments is a hierarchy structure. Of course, the worst one to commit a sin against is the first commandment. And when you commit a sin, the first three commandments, you offend God directly. And then the next seven commandments, you offend God and your neighbor. So the worst one is the first commandment. And sacrilege is one of the ways to offend our Lord. And this is in receiving the Eucharist, once again, immortal sin. I want to go on. Our lady goes on and says, often during this epoch, our time, she means, the enemies, enemies of Jesus Christ instigated by the devil will steal consecrated hosts from the churches so that they might profane the Eucharistic species. My most holy son will see himself cast upon the ground and trampled upon by irreverent feet. We see this happening today, my friends, in the whole church. Communion on a hand is an abomination in God's sight. When you put a host on someone's hand, particles fall on the floor all the time, and they notice and so what's happened at the average Novus Ordo Mass? Communion on hand. And they, they, they've done many tests where they take hosts that are not consecrated. And they, they put it on people's hand. And they see there's always a particle. That's why when a priest celebrates Mass properly, once we consecrate the host, our fingers never separate. Because there may be a particle on my finger there. And then... We purify the chat, uh, our, uh, our pattern and the chalice. And usually there's always a particle. In the old rite, when we give communion out to priest, the, the altar boy always has a pattern. The pattern is to catch any particle of the host if it falls. In the Novus Ordo Church, they give uh, communion out like it's a piece of candy. And so our Lord is literally embedded in the rugs throughout the whole church, throughout the whole world, embedded. And then people step all over our Lord in his glorified body. You wonder why <laughs> he's upset. You wonder why our ladies wanted us so that we wouldn't do this. And then what do they do? Then they come and they vacuum the rug and they suck our Lord up in, his, in the Holy Eucharist. And after that, they throw them in the garbage. And then the garbage goes to the dump. Our dumps throughout the whole world are filled with the body of Christ. As long as that particle remains a particle. Who's upset about it? Who cries? I just spoke to a priest recently, and he told his, his superiors that he wouldn't give communion on hand no more. It was against his conscience. And he told them why. And they couldn't refute him that he, of what the things I just told you. And you know what they told them? The church allows it, therefore you must do it. My friends, that is false obedience. And they use this obedience, this false obedience, to destroy the church. So Our Lady warned us that our Lord is being trampled upon. If that doesn't break your heart, if that doesn't make you weep, it's a sign that you don't love Jesus. It's a sign that you don't have the gift of faith, that you don't believe that Jesus is truly present, body, soul, divinity in the Eucharist once the priest consecrates using proper form and matter. And this is, we're going to pay for these sins, and we are paying for them. I go on with the prophecies. A lady said, during this time, in so much as this poor country lacked the Christian spirit, the sacrament of extreme unction will be little esteemed. Many people will die without receiving it, either because of negligence of their families or misconceived affections of their sick ones. This is happening now. And I warn people what's going on in the world now. What they're doing this is attack on God and his church. 
And once again, our shepherds should be defending the flock, and they're not. They should be fighting this, and they don't. Last year, in the pandemic, the bishops, the U.S. bishops, sold us out. Sold us out. They're worse than Judas. Judas sold our Lord out for 30 pieces of silver. But the U.S. bishops sold us out in the United States, shut down the churches and the sacraments for $3 billion. $3 billion. And so many people died without the sacraments. Shame on those bishops. They have to answer for that. I think it's in the book of Ezekiel. Our Lord says, woe to you shepherds who instead of gather my sheep, scatter them. Woe to you shepherds instead of feeding my sheep, devour them. What is When our Lord uses the word woe in the scripture, it means, may you burn in hell. My friends, they have lost their faith, these bishops. And as a bishop, you are supposed to be willing to lay down your life for the little ones. And they are handing us over to the wolves. Our lady prophesied this in Our Lady Good Success 400 years ago. 400 years ago. You know, I always tell people that the third secret of Fatima, the Vatican was supposed to release it. But we know that's nonsense. They hid it from us. And Our Lady knew they would hide it from us. And so 300 years before Fatima, she revealed these prophecies for us that I'm reading to you so that we would know what they are. And this is what's happened. They're all connected. Good success, Fatima, a lady of Akita, all connected. I go on with the prophecies. As for the sacrament of matrimony, our lady said, which symbolizes the union of Christ with his church, it will be attacked and profane in the fullest sense of the word. Freemason, which will then be in power, will enact iniquitous laws with the aim of doing away with the sacrament, making it easy for everyone to live in sin and encouraging the procreation of illegitimate children born without the blessing of the church. This is so true. How the sacrament of matrimony, once again, the sacraments are the main means of salvation. And the devils is like cutting the legs off the church, attacking us in the sacraments. And so we see today in our societies, Masons promoting all unnatural vices, homosexual, lesbians getting married. There's no marriage. When God created Adam and Eve, he created man. He created woman for man, not man for man. And God introduced the sacrament of matrimony. And nobody can change that. You can't play around with that. And any priest like me that speaks out against this, they want to take your head. <laughs> Praise God, I hope they do. We got to be willing to lay down our lives for the church. Lay down our lives for the church. And that's one of the lessons we learn with the apparition of Our Lady of Good Success. When we look at Mother Mariana Torres, she was a victim soul. She died three times. Two times she came back to life. She gave her life totally for the church and for our times. And this is the spirits that's missing in the church. Nobody wants to be a saint no more. Nobody's encouraged to be a saint. Nobody, the spirit of sacrifice has left the church. And that's what Catholicism is all about, being crucified with Christ. Crucified. Our Lord said, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Our Lady of Fatima told us that the reason why most souls go to hell is because no one will pray or do penance for them. When we read the life of Mother Mariana, we see what a victim soul she was. And there was a bad nun in the convent that was leading the revolution inside her convent. And they called her El Capitan. And our, lay, our Lord revealed that she was going to be cast into the pit of hell. And that she would, he would spare her if Mother Mariana would consent to suffering the pains of hell on earth for five years. Five years. For one soul. 
and you know Mela Marietta, who was filled with heroic virtue and on fire with the love of God and the Blessed Virgin, said, yes, I will do that. Mother Mariana was educated. She knew the faith inside out. She knew what it meant intellectually, what the pains of hell are. You got the pains of sense in your body, your pains of the fire. And all the senses, the way you offended God, the more you offended God in a particular sense, the more you will suffer in that sense. And, and St. Anthony Mary Clara tells us that uh, the souls in hell are like uh, fish in a fish tank surrounded by fire. Fire coming out of their eyes, their ears, their nose, the their very bowels. She knew that she would suffer that for this one soul. She said, yes. The greatest pain in hell is the pain of loss. Because when you die, you, the veil is lifted. You realize that you lost the infinite good infinite love, which is God himself. And the pain of loss is in proportion to what you have lost. In proportion. So when you lose a couple of, say, 25 cents, a dollar, ain't balling, but say you lost all your possessions in life, it'd be a lot more painful. Well, when you're in hell, you realize that you lost the infinite good. Therefore, the pain is infinite. And in those five years, Mother Aunt Mariana suffered the pains of hell. She, she felt like it was for eternity because that's part of the pain that you know it will never end. So in other words, Judas is in hell for 2,000 years already. It's like his first day, first moment, and it goes on and on for eternity. God is looking for souls, my friends, that are willing to deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow him. Looking for souls, our Lady of Fatima told us that if we pray for souls, they won't go to hell. Are you willing to pray for your loved ones that are astray? Are you willing to pray for the Pope who's gone astray and all these prelates that have abandoned their flock? This is what we need. Another prophecy from Our Lady, I quote, the sacred sacrament of holy orders will be ridiculed, oppressed, and despised. The devil will try to persecute the ministers of the Lord in every possible way. He will labor with cruel and subtle astuteness to deviate them from the spirit of their vocation and corrupt many of them. These depraved priests who will scandalize the Christian people will make the hatred of the bad Catholics and the enemies of the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church fall upon all priests. This apparent triumph of Satan will bring enormous suffering upon the good pastors of the church. We could see with the scandals that have taken place in the Catholic Church of the pedophiles and so forth, many scandals. It's, it's so heart-wrenching when we see what has happened in the church, especially since the council. I was reading statistics recently that after the Second Vatican Council, in the first 10 years, approximately 70,000 to 100,000 priests left the priesthood, left their vocation. And then we see all the bad priests. And we know that the communists, Masons, infiltrated the church. Bella Dodd, who was a communist, testified after her conversion before Congress that she alone was responsible for over 1,100 priests infiltrating the Catholic Church to take the church down from within. Many of them became bishops. And so, my friends, this is devastating. The seminaries have been filled with homosexuals for years and years and years. And the bishops ordained them, ordained these men. It's one big battle. I've been fighting that battle since I've been in the church. It's been a hard battle. But if you stand up and, and you say you're not going to tolerate that, whew, they're going to come for you. And they do. But this is what's going on. And so the bad priests, inflict this on the good priests. So it's very sad when somebody, I've seen people in the airport when I'm walking by, they'll grab their kid and they see me coming because they know I'm a priest, like I'm gonna grab their kid and do something. 
So this punishment has fallen upon us all. And the priests have been so poorly trained in theology. Uh, even the so-called good ones, the so-called good ones, they, they haven't been trained right. And so they fall into heresies. They don't even know half of them are in heresies. They're full-blown modernism. I've met so many good men over the years. You see, they have zeal. They want to serve Christ in his church. And then they're told by these so-called good priests, don't worry, go to the regular seminary. And yeah, they're going to teach you bad things, but don't worry. You study on your own. You get, get ordained. Do whatever they tell you. And then when you get out, don't worry. Three years after you're ordained, they're going to make you a pastor because there's such a shortage of priests. These are all lot, And these are true. They do make you pastor quick. Not if you're orthodox, though. But what they don't realize, these young men, is the system is so corrupt that when you go through six years, eight years of formation, and you compromise, 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 you wake up one day, you're a full-blown modernist, and you don't even know it. And you're going to continue to compromise. There's a basic moral principle I wish all these men would use. You can never use evil means to obtain a good end. Never. And it's constantly being applied. Not being applied, excuse me. That they use, oh, yeah, don't worry, we're going to go reform the church. No, no, my friends, they reform you. We cannot tolerate this evil. And if God wants you to be a priest, he's called you, then he'll find the way for you to get ordained properly and to learn the truth. St. Alphonse tells us, it's a mortal sin to enter an order or a diocese, you could say too, if they're not being faithful to the original charism and to the teachings of the church. How can you do this? I met a young man once in a seminary who was supposed to be one of the best seminaries in the United States. It was a cesspool, like all the rest. It wasn't better than the others, yes. So one, he was trying to argue with me, and I said, I have one question for you, because I knew what happened, what happens there. I said, did you go to Mass today? Of course, every morning, Father. I said, were you able to receive our Lord when you received Holy Communion on your knees and on your tongue? And he looked at me, he almost started to weep. No, I said, why not? He said, it's forbidden. I said, so here you are, compromising, compromising, compromising. Nobody can deny you to receive our Lord on your tongue, on your knees. Nobody can. And so you listen to these apostate bishops who will punish you, who will not ordain you. You're better off not being ordained if you're going to become Judas like them and betray God. 